These were the extremes of the early 20th century, the ideals presented at the World's Fair, and then this gritty and sometimes violent city outside the gates. It was a vibrant, dynamic place. It was filled with ideas and discussions and disagreements. And yet people didn't necessarily think they were living through any great historic era. They worried about a lot of regular, mundane, everyday things. They were a lot like us. In 1900, St. Louis was still a growing city of 575,000. Boosters were shooting for a million. It was the fourth largest city in America, but a distant fourth to New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago. Most people were first-generation Americans or foreign-born. There were a lot of different ethnic groups, lots of languages, but this was a very German city. Laura Marsalek was born in St. Louis in 1894. She turned six during the summer of the streetcar strike. She grew up knowing two languages, but it was English she spoke at home. German you learned to get by in the neighborhood. I picked it up from the neighbors. My, uh, they spoke it all together. They didn't speak no English at all. And if I wanted to know, know what they were saying to me, and especially when they'd bake and call me to get something good they baked, I had to learn it. I had to learn German. We used to get our vegetables um, from a f farmer that came in, and uh, he was a singing farmer. And he'd come in and sing out his uh, what he had, what vegetables he had. Shane in German. Shane green bona. That's green beans, you know. They lived in a flat on South Broadway. Laura's father was a house painter. There were lots of jobs in turn-of-the-century St. Louis. The downtown skyscrapers were filled with managers, clerks, and telephone operators. In those days, you could shoe horses or build automobiles. You could work in a printing plant. You could roll steel or roll cigars, work in a box factory or a brewery. Thousands of people were employed in the garment district along Washington Avenue and in the couple's station warehouses by the rail yard. The levee would never be what it had been in the 1800s, but there were still boats and jobs, and black workers, as they had for a long time, were doing much of the loading and unloading. At the turn of the century, African Americans made up about 6% of St. Louis's population. Nobody talked much about what was later called the Negro problem but serious social issues involving race would soon have to be dealt with. You have increasingly, as we approach the 1900 mark, uh, a growing professional class of teachers. Um, we're beginning to have physicians, lawyers. You also have an upper class community of African Americans in St. Louis that have always been here since before the Civil War. This too was the heyday of ragtime. The clubs in St. Louis drew the great ragtime artists and Scott Joplin was publishing his rags and selling them all over the country. It was just one small part of what was going on in this American city. I think that's an important thing to remember that people at the turn of the century believed that cities were good places, they were the center of, of culture and economics. How do we keep the, those things that we need in the city and also make it more livable and, and, and better able to govern it? Government was a problem. The impressive new city hall was riddled with corruption. The most powerful man in politics didn't even have an office here. He wasn't appointed or elected to anything. He was just the boss. Irish-born Ed Butler, he came to St. Louis a blacksmith and ended up running a political machine. By the turn of the century, Boss Butler had been controlling votes for 25 years. To get things done at City Hall, you had to pay off Butler's men. Everybody knew how it worked, and big business played right along. They called it Boodle. It just became that you had to pay for everything. That's when they came up with the price list. See, they came up with price lists. 
And they would simply show you the price list and say, oh, you're asking, for, here's what the price is for that. This one's 10000 this one's 25000 You decide. And then you pay us. We'll take care of Boss Butler. Uh, we'll pass out the money within our combine. Uh, and uh, that's the way it will be. Muckraking journalist Lincoln Steffens embarrassed St. Louis in his nationally published writings on corruption. He said that St. Louis was making two announcements to the world, one that it was the worst governed city in the world, the other that everyone should come there for the World's Fair. Steffens started his series in St. Louis City Hall because he had a good story with a hero, Joseph Folk. Folk had tried to help settle the streetcar strike in 1900 and then was asked to run for circuit attorney. At Butler's machine helped deliver the votes and then Folk turned on the very system that put him into office. He went after the boodlers, not just the ones in City Hall, but those in big business. In the years leading up to the World's Fair, the papers were filled with headlines of investigations, disappearing suspects, confessions, grand juries, and trials. Because of Joseph Folk, 24 politicians and businessmen were indicted, including Boss Butler himself. Folk can certainly be credited with having, uh, by and large, put the boodling on its last legs in St. Louis, even though not everybody went to jail and not everybody stayed in jail if they got there. Ed Butler's conviction didn't hold up, but the days of his old-style boss rule in St. Louis were over. As for Joseph Folk, or Holy Joe as some called him, his anti-boodling crusade got him elected governor of Missouri in 1905. Mayor Wells had kept his distance from Folk's brand of reform. Instead of cleaning out City Hall, the mayor was busy paving streets, putting in street lights, and building sewers. And tackling a problem that affected everyone in the city, from the poorest slum dweller to the richest West End millionaire. St. Louisans had long lived with, cooked with, drank and bathed in dirty water. But until the World's Fair came into the picture, nobody seemed to mind that much. I remember my mother saying to my father, just let it run and it'll finally clear up. I guess sometimes they'd leave it run a half hour and it'd still be muddy. This became a particularly pressing issue at the turn of the century because St. Louis was about to have a World's Fair and water was going to be an important component in this World's Fair. They had planned to decorate the fair with lagoons, with waterfalls, with fountains. How would it look to the rest of the world if there's muddy water pouring out of the statuary? The city's water intake was at the chain of rocks near the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, and there was still plenty of dirt in it when it was pumped to the water towers and then throughout the city. A panel of experts looked at two solutions, building a filtration system or finding a new water source. But neither proposal met Mayor Wells' budget restrictions or his deadline. Whatever was done had to be in place by the World's Fair. So they tried something new, chemicals, coagulants, which pulled the dirt out of the water, and it cleared up. And even though they had to cut back on the chemicals when the seals and the fish at the fair started to die off, they got what they wanted. Crystal clear water was the visual centerpiece of the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition. The summer of the World's Fair, Laura Marsalek turned 10 years old. The Cascades were beautiful. Whenever we went, we always went for the day. And of course, they had so many interesting things at the World's Fairs, things that we never saw before. And um, it was a wonderful, marvelous place to be. It was the result of years of planning, fundraising, and construction and David R. Francis's tireless worldwide promotion. This was supposed to have been the 1903 St. Louis World's Fair, but there was so much to do, it opened a year late. In St. Louis history, there really is nothing else like the World's Fair. But in the bigger picture, this was one of the great fairs of the era. St. Louis 
and Chicago and Buffalo and San Francisco and Omaha, they shared a great deal in their fairgrounds. Even though each city will give you a different line explaining why its fair was special, and each fair was special. But the resemblances, I think, are stronger than uh, the dissimilarities. And it's, you're not sure where you are when you take a look at those wonderful photographs. In the days before movie theaters, before broadcasting, this was the only place you could see the world and its people. It was beautiful, instructive, and fun. A collection of the best music, science, technology, and entertainment, and food from around the world, set amid incredible gardens and dazzling views. These were vanishing cities, and um, you had six months to see them, and that was it. That's why so many people attended. Tens of millions of people went to these fairs. For people who lived in St. Louis, the experience of a lifetime was just a streetcar ride away. Edmund Philibert was a 30-year-old St. Louis carpenter who went to the fair 28 times, each night meticulously recording his experiences. I made my 23rd visit to the fair today. We stopped at the wireless telegraph station. They could send messages to Chicago and several other places. After lunch, we went to the baby incubators. One baby was as small as a doll. Its hand was about as big as my thumb. We went to the Chinese village next and saw the fire eater perform the same tricks as usual. It cost 50 cents to get into the fair and more after that for food and different attractions, especially along the pike, the long strip of sideshows and rides where the real fun was. The dancers, the magicians, the fun houses. There was something for everyone. One ten-year-old girl was fascinated by the Filipino natives living on the fairgrounds. They had them on this, in this little village out there at the fair, and I was very much interested in them. I used to tell my mother, let's go to see the Igualdes and see what they're doing today. The Philippines had become a U.S. possession after the Spanish-American War. On the pike, you could pay to see a reenactment of an American naval victory using model ships. Another whole section of the fair was devoted to the Philippine history and culture that included the Igorot village. Today, it would seem unthinkable to display real people in such a way, but the fair was an unabashed celebration of Western civilization, of its superior intellectual and scientific achievements, and the firm belief that if we could spread that around the world, everyone would be better off. We know these fairs were racially segregated and they rested on a, um, a rather ethnocentric vision of the world. They were something with all of their prejudices that we are not, which is self-confident about themselves and their future. December 1st, 1904. I made my 28th and last visit to the World's Fair today. It made me feel a little sad to think that it would soon be all over forever, for I had spent many pleasant days there. But everything must come to an end sometime. So I left the Lindell entrance for the last time at about half past seven.